So while the last few people find a seat, I just wanted to explain what you've been watching and probably what's making you slightly dizzy on the front here. What we're looking at is the land of the midnight sun. Have you ever heard that the polar areas are sometimes called that? Um, and this is what happens to uh, very, very high latitudes. So this is the Arctic in the very middle of summer. And you can see that the sun may get down close to the horizon, but it never actually sets. It just sort of bounces off the horizon um, throughout the, the year. And we're going to look today at why that's the case. What is it about Earth's orbit and the way we're tilted and everything else that means that that happens? Um, and obviously, if we're getting 24 hours of sunlight, then that's why our poles get a lot warmer in the summers. So I just wanted to explain what you were seeing at the front there. So uh, today, we're going to talk about Earth's regional climates. So why we have deserts and very hot climates in certain places and pretty cold, barren uh, climates in other places. Uh, there's sort of fairly uh, obvious answers to those, but we're going to talk through them just to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay? Um, so a couple of announcements. How was the quiz? <laughs> some people say easy, some people are groaning at me. Um, so that sounds like I got it about right then, because uh, I would like a spectrum. Um, but what I wanted to make sure that people know is that if you go back after class, let me get time to run back to my office and change the settings. But I'll change the settings so you can go back and you can look at the, the three submissions or however many times you submitted the answers, and you can see which ones you got right or wrong. So I do really encourage you to just not see it as something that you've done and now move on, but go back and see which ones you've got right or wrong. See if you can work out why that's the case. And if not, then obviously the TAs in discussion or uh, me in office hours, I would be very happy to sh uh, talk to you about that. Um, the survey, remember that uh, we have two surveys, one at the beginning of class and one at the end, and they each count as one day's participation credit. And the first survey will close tomorrow at 11.45 p.m. So if you haven't taken the chance to, do, uh, to fill that in um, and you would like to take that opportunity, then please do. Um, if you, yeah. Is the first survey the one, like, what do you know about science? Yeah, it's the what you know about science one. Um, and so you should be able to access it through Triple E. Just click on surveys. Uh, if you can't find it, then send me a quick email and I can uh, send you a link. Um, and lastly, just to, oh, hang on. Yeah. So you don't get your answers, I'm afraid, for the first survey. I don't see the results either, so it's a mystery still. Yeah. Wait, so the first survey is the one that is we can participate in this study and it's a, the 30 questions for the yeah. first time. What is the second survey? The second survey will be another thing for that same uh, research study and it will be at the end of the class. Okay? So if there are any um, people that are on the wait list or um, are a part of extensional access that don't have access, then please do let me know and I can make sure you have access. As a quick reminder from me and the TAs, uh, the discussions will involve doing math. The, the first few discussions have encountered that today. I think to the, the discussion this week is probably one of the most challenging um, of the quarter. So don't panic if uh, you are feeling a bit lost today. But those concepts are really important concepts. So I do think it's a really valuable chance for you to think about those. So do bring calculators to discussion. And uh, whoever ran off with the calculator from the discussion immediately before this one, can you return it, please, because we need those. OK. Uh, does anyone have questions about the class logistics in general? No? OK, great. In that case, let's move on to what we're going to look at today. First of all, we're going to look at or be aware that there are many different climate types on Earth. And we're going to have a look idea about why they are where they are. And we're going to look at identifying those particular climate zones, those climate areas that contain aspects of the, the cryosphere and why they are where they are, and why they are when they are, if that makes sense. Um, and then we're going to take a last look at what the climate system actually involves. Because what we're going to do for Wednesday and Friday is really look at how our climate has changed in the past, what it's doing now. And on Friday, we're really going to focus on the various aspects that might control what it will do in the future, which is obviously of importance to everyone uh, on this world, not just whether you're in the class or not. And so we're going to look at the climate system and understand that really it's characterized by change. It's never going to be completely stable through time, um, but we're going to look at certain aspects that can change.
So first of all, let's do some definitions. What is the difference between weather and climate? Uh, because the media often get it wrong. So weather is the state of the atmosphere at any one particular time and place. Um, so, for, for example, today, if you go outside, it's beautifully warm and sunny, no clouds. Um, if we're meteorologists, if we're sort of people that talk about weather, we would talk about air pressure, we would talk about humidity, so how much moisture there is in the air, cloudiness, things like wind speed and direction. Those are all things that describe weather. And if you ask someone what the weather's like outside, that's what they would tell you. Climate is the average of that weather. <coughs> It's saying over 30 years, the temperature might be this one day, this no. What's the average temperature over that time? Okay, so that's what we talk about when we mean climate. So first, I click a question of the day: Which of these 2030 news stories? They're all from last summer or afterwards. Which of them relate to climate rather than weather? So we have for A, we have the super typhoon that hit the Philippines, and actually was the strongest storm ever to make landfall, uh, on, in our instrumental records at least. In B, we have our, our record setting temperatures as we had that heat wave at the beginning of last summer. And then in C, we have tornadoes which hit the Midwest in November, which is actually the latest recorded um, example of tornadoes. Or is it D, all of them? Or is it E, none of them? So why don't you think about it for a second and let me know. So five more seconds or so for the last few votes. Right, so let's see how we're doing today. <laughs> so people either say B or E. And about 45 people said D. Okay, so which of these relate to climate rather than weather? The E's would be correct. None of them actually talk, hang on, yeah, none of them are about climate, they are all about weather. And this is why it's so difficult when we talk and we read about climate change in the media. Most often it's not climate that we're talking about, it's weather. So for, let's have a look at some of these examples. So the super typhoon, it was incredibly strong, but we can't assign that one event to climate change. What we could do is we could, say, look at uh, storms over the next sort of 10, 20, 30 years, and if they're all a little bit stronger, then we could say, yes, that's something related to climate change. And it's something that we expect, because these things are really fueled by warm water. And if our oceans are going to warm, then it makes sense that our storms might become a little bit more intense. But we can't say that that one storm is anything to do with climate change. It might just be noise, background noise. Um, the tornadoes that hit the Midwest states, it's the same. It's unusual. We might expect to see that in the future sort of fits in with our idea of what climate change might be. But it could just be something really unusual. We can't say that that one thing is related to climate change or climate in general. And our heat wave, this is absolutely something that we're expecting to change in the future. We're expecting to see much more extremes, but not just of high temperatures, also sometimes cold temperatures. So we have this sort of background state and we wobble around it. We know we're not exactly the same temperature every day. And so, yes, it was extremely hot that week. And if anyone, I think we were camping, which was pretty miserable down near San Diego. And so, yes, it was really hot. And that's something we will expect. But until we say have 10, 20, 30 years of data, we can't say that that one event was anything to do with climate. So does that make sense now? I think there was a bit of... Uh, so this is something that you can do. You can play along at home. You can look at the media and the news stories, especially with the polar vortex, because we have the polar vortex, which means climate change is off, of course. 
And so this is the thing. We have to be careful when we look at the media and how we report science. It's a lot less exciting, obviously, but it's the case. So remember, our climate is our average weather. And so let's look at this another way. What is the climate like at this location? Does anyone know where this is? Joshua Tree, yeah, absolutely. It's one of the national parks. If you haven't been, it's very close. It's only a couple of hours away, and it's beautiful. Do you think this is what it usually looks like? No. OK, what do you think its climate usually is like? It's desert. It might look something more like that. OK? That's what we're used to seeing. We're used to seeing sort of beautiful blue skies. Uh, it looks sort of warmer. It looks drier. That's sort of what our climate are, is like. But every now and again, we have weather. It snows up there sometimes. And it's very rare, but it is weather. OK. So our climate here is pretty hot and dry. What's the climate like here? Humid, pretty, pretty wet probably. What about the temperature? Pretty hot? What about here? What's the temperature like here? Cooler. How do you know? <laughs> the treats, the vegetation. And that's the thing. You all live in the world. You already have this sort of knowledge of Earth system science. And really, when we're looking at trying to distinguish different climate zones, that's what we use. We use vegetation type. That vegetation really nicely sort of delineates these different climate zones. And of course, we're sort of drawing arbitrary boundaries, but they're, they're a nice indication of what's going on with our climate. And so uh, there's lots of these, what we call, it's uh, the Kirpin system. These are the Kirpin climate zones. And you can see that they, um, they use this vegetation, and we, we've split them into types. So type A is tropical, B is dry, C is mild, D is severe mid-latitude, E is polar, and H <laughs> is highland. Okay? Um, and please don't worry about all of these other ones. So these are all sort of other subdivisions. So for example, um, if we went to sort of uh, Irvine here, then our sort of climate would be Mediterranean winter dry or something like that. Um, but that's sort of the idea behind this, and we can divide them up. So I do not want you at all to memorize all of these 32 or however many there are different subtypes. It's a complete waste of your time. What I would like you to be aware of, though, is that those six, the tropical, the dry, the mild mid-latitude, the severe mid-latitude, polar, and highland. Okay? So those are ones I would like you to be familiar with. And we're going to look today at where they are, how they are distributed over the Earth. So here's my map. And we're going to spend a little time looking at my map. So you can see that those tropical climates are colored in sort of reddish, orange, yellow. The dry climates are those sort of sandy, beigey, uh, sort of brown colors. The mild mid-latitudes are the nice pale greens. The severe mid-latitudes are these sort of blues and purples. Then we have polar climates as our, pur as our darker purple, and highland as this sort of pink color. So what I want you to do is in groups of two or three, so speak to your neighbors about this as well, think about which climate zones will contain parts of the cryosphere and look at where those zones are. Think about why they're distributed, where they're distributed, because that's what we're going to spend the rest of today thinking about. Okay? So which climate zones will contain parts of the cryosphere, why and where are they found? Okay? And the TAs, wave at me TAs. They're scattered around, so they'll wander around and help you out as well. Yeah. Where is the cryosphere? So, which of those? Uh, hang on, one, two, three, four, five, six. Which is the most obvious one that contains parts of the cryosphere of our climate zones? Uh, yeah, so it seems like the, the cryosphere, I think. Yeah, it would be an E, right? The polar climate, so it would make sense. Okay. So definitely they'll be in the poles. 
where else though, if you look at that map, if you think about where there might be snow, where there might be ice, where, if you look at that map and think about where that is, what sort of climate zones do they sort of match up with? Okay? Island, cold. Yeah. <laughs> and there's one more. There's one more. So I came up with three separate ones. Okay? So chat to your neighbor and see if you can think of the last one. So it's more of a challenge for you guys back here as you can't see so well. But what do you think? What's the most obvious climate zone that's going to contain bits of the cryosphere? Which of those six? The polar climate. That's a pretty good guess. Okay, I'm, I really, you're making this more complicated than it needs to be. So if you were thinking though, if you were to look at that map and it's like a satellite image from space, where would the snow and ice be? And think about which of those climate zones that actually is. Where else? Which other climate zones might the cryosphere be important in? Which one? D. D, yeah, absolutely. You can imagine that Siberia, Russia, it's pretty covered with snow for a lot of the year, right? So those severe mid-latitude climates definitely have these sort of harsh winters where the cryosphere is important. And then there's one more to see if you can come up with one more, okay? So I came up with three separate of these, three of these six climate zones I decided were important for the cryosphere. So does someone want to give me a suggestion of one of these climate zones that would be important for the cryosphere? Yeah. Polar. Polar. Okay. No, it's not a challenging question here. So polar, polar climate zones are obviously going to have quite large components of the cryosphere contained within them. Absolutely. Any others? Yeah. Highland, absolutely. We've already said that around here, where the snow falls is up at the top of the mountains. So we'll look at why that is the case, why it gets colder as we go up. Any of the others? Where else would we get snow for some parts of the year? Yeah. D. Yeah, the D, the severe mid-latitude climates. <laughs> They're not particularly friendly places to live in places like Siberia where it's sort of snow covered for large parts of the year. So those were the three that I decided really sort of characterized uh, places where the cryosphere uh, is located. So for the rest of today, we're really going to think about these regions. We're going to think about the polar areas. Why are they cold? We know that it's cold at the poles, but why? We're going to look at those areas with really cold winters, those severe mid-latitude climates, and we're going to look at why we have seasons and what that means for us. And then lastly, we're going to look at highland regions and think about why it gets cold as we go up in our atmosphere. So first of all, polar areas. Why is it cold at the poles? Because I said, well, the amount of sunlight reaching the top of our atmosphere is more or less constant, right? We defined it. We said it's a solar constant. So why are the poles colder than the equator? And it's because the Earth is spherical. We are a ball of rock. And so one of the easiest ways, I think, of thinking about this is if you have a flashlight. If you have a flashlight and you shine it straight down at the floor near your feet, then there's going to be a small area that's lit up, but it's going to be quite bright. Yeah? Everyone agree with me? If I take that flashlight and I instead I shine it along the floor, so at a lower angle, it's going to brighten a larger area, but it's not going to be as bright, right? It's going to be more dim and, and spread out. And that's exactly the same that's happening with the sun. Because yes, for every one meter squared, we're getting the same amount of energy coming from the sun. But at the equator, where we're more sort of sideways on, then that light doesn't really get spread out very much. It's much more just like shining a flashlight at the floor immediately beneath you. Up at the poles, where the sun would be sort of lower in the horizon, and that, that same amount of energy comes in but is spread over a much larger area because of that curvature of the Earth. Okay? And so if that energy is spread out over a much larger area, it's not going to get as hot. 
right? So really, it's to do with this idea, it's called beam spreading. So we get more beam spreading towards the poles, and so it's colder in those regions. Okay. So first of all, the, po the poles are just cold because of that. But we also need to think about particularly sort of cold winters, because that, that uh, video I showed you at the beginning with the sort of the midnight sun bouncing off the horizon, it wasn't ice covered then, was it? It was sort of, it wasn't particularly warm necessarily, but we had green uh, vegetation growing, whereas if we went back in winter, it would be a much more miserable place. So let's think now about the seasons. So things like what generates our cold winters in some places, and they tend to be at those higher latitudes close to where our poles are. So why do we experience seasons? Well, first of all, because the Earth is spherical, that's still important, but also because of the mechanics of Earth's orbit around the sun. And we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about revolution, and this is not a complicated idea, it's just the fact that we go around the sun once a year. We're going to talk about rotation, which is what gives us our day and night, our spin around an axis. And then we're going to talk about tilt, which is really the reason that we have our seasons. So first of all, let's talk about revolution. We go around the sun once every year. It takes us 365 and a quarter days to go all the way around. Um, and you can see that if we plot our orbit, then, it's, then the sun isn't perfectly in the middle. We're slightly elliptical, um, and what that means is that, say right now, in January the 4th, we're only about 147 million only. We're only about 147 million kilometers from the sun. Whereas, in July, we're actually 152 million kilometers. And in reality, that's a really small difference. It doesn't, that isn't the reason that we have seasons. That little change from sort of, in, in terms of distance, doesn't have a big effect on our seasons, okay? We also rotate. We have a, a spin axis that goes from our uh, geographic north pole to our south pole, and we spin around on that axis, so once every 24 hours, and that's why we have day and night. And if we combine both of those things, that revolution around the, the sun and also that rotation, if we combine that with our tilt, this is why we really have seasons. Because the Earth is not sort of north, south, sort of vertically um, in space. It's actually tilted over. And it's tilted over at about 23 and a half degrees. And because of that tilt, we get different amounts of sunlight reaching the different hemispheres, the northern hemisphere, so above the equator, and the southern hemisphere below the equator. We get different amounts of radiation arriving at those throughout the year because of that tilt. Because that tilt affects things like the period of daylight that we experience. It certainly affects sort of how much beam spreading we experience. And also something called atmospheric beam depletion, which I'll show you an image of at the end. Okay. So this is our little diagram, and diagrams are all very well, but I get a bit bored of slides after a while, and I think it's much more exciting to think about this in terms of the, my real Earth. So my ver real, very pink Earth is here, and we're going to have it tilted. So the sun is going to be in the middle here. This is going to be my sun. And in the northern hemisphere summer, my Earth is tilted towards the sun, okay? So this is my summer solstice. The tilt is tilted towards the sun. And what does that mean? That means that as I rotate the Earth on its axis, my finger's the North Pole here. It's always in daylight. However much I spin this, I'm never going to end up on that side, okay? So there's always going to be sunlight Sorry, these guys at the side. There's always going to be sunlight at the North Pole. And that's why we have land of the midnight sun. That's why the sun never sets at a certain point above, uh, I think it's, I can't remember what latitude it is now, but above that latitude, the sun never sets in the summer. And the key thing to note is that that angle of tilt, as we rotate, as we revolve around the sun, that angle stays constant. So by the time I get to this side, so the sun is still in the middle. Now as I spin my Earth, however much I spin it, my finger here at the North Pole is never going to see the sun. The rest of the Earth is going to be blocking that sunlight, and so it gets 24-hour nights. 
Okay, whereas in the meantime, now my south pole is pointed towards the sun, and however much I rotate this, my south pole is always going to be in sunlight. Does that make sense so far? Yep. So now let's think, if I continue my revolution around the sun, if I get to this point, so my axis is still orientated the same way as it was before, now as I spin this, here's my, my north pole and my south pole, they're both actually getting the same amount of sunlight, right? Everywhere on Earth, in the spring and the autumn equinoxes, gets exactly the same amount of sunlight, okay? Because the, the tilt is sideways on to the sun, okay? So this is something you can do at home, grab a basketball or something, and you can work this out in your head. But I think it's helpful seeing that rather than just on paper. Okay, so... That's what that diagram more or less shows you, is that that tilt in the summer solstice, which is June, which of course is summer for the northern hemisphere, but winter for the southern hemisphere, our tilt is towards the sun. If we keep that tilt constant as we revolve around the sun, then by the time we get to December, now the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, the southern hemisphere is tilted towards, so in winter, we're in winter in the northern hemisphere and summer in the southern hemisphere. And then at our equinoxes, the clue is in the name, that equinoxes, everyone gets equal amounts of sunlight. Okay? So that's what, what happens to our period of daylight. And so at the equator, whatever happens, we always get 12 hours of daylight. So my question for you is, which position would the Earth be, A, B, C, or D? What position would the Earth be in if I want the North Pole to experience 24-hour nights, okay? So look at the angle of the tilt. Think about when the Earth or when the North Pole would experience 24-hour nights. Few more seconds for the last few votes. Okay, so let's see how we did. Oh, pretty well. Great. Okay, so I think at least 70% of us have this idea. And the idea is that the North Pole would experience 24 nights at B because however we spin that Earth, that point, it's never going to be pointing towards the sun, so it's going to be hidden behind the Earth, and so it won't receive any sunlight. So sometimes that takes a bit of thinking about. Um, I'll ask another me and I click a question in a little while, um, and you can think again. Okay. So this just shows what happens. So this is our March and September equinoxes, and it shows that everywhere on Earth, if you look along this left-hand side here, everywhere on Earth will have 12 hours of sunlight. Um, in the June solstice, you can see that down at the South Pole we have zero, up at the top we have 24 hours of sunlight, and in the middle at the equator, there's 12 hours again, so we get this sort of gradation. And then completely the opposite will happen for the winter, the December solstice. Okay? And if this is really messing with your head, there's a YouTube video there which is a really it sort of basically insults your intelligence because it treats you like you're about five. But it is a really nice sort of visual demonstration of how those sort of, uh, that, that happens, those seasons change. So that would really help out if you're struggling to picture this. Okay, so because we have that tilt, you can imagine that in the northern hemisphere during the summer, when we're tilted towards the sun, we get less beam spreading. That sun is more overhead. It's not as spread out. And so not only do we have more hours of daylight, but also we're not going to be as that, we're not going to have as much beam spreading um, as sort of other areas. Okay? And then lastly, we have atmospheric beam depletion. And do you remember we said that, yes, we get a certain amount of energy arriving at the top of our atmosphere, but as it travels through the atmosphere, some of it gets reflected back, some of it gets scattered, some of it gets absorbed, and so less of it arrives at the, the base of the atmosphere at sea level. And if you think about how um, the geometry works out, if the sun is more overhead, 
then it has a shorter distance of atmosphere to go through than if the, if the, the sun is really lower in the horizon. And this is one of the reasons why we have lovely red sunsets, because when the sun is setting, it has much, much greater thicknesses of atmosphere to travel through. And so there's a lot more scattering, and blue light especially is more easily scattered. And so what we get left, where just when the sun sets, is red light. That's an aside, that's not important, but if you wanted to know why, then that's a cool thing. So if our sun is higher in the sky, there's going to be less beam spreading and also less beam depletion because it has less thickness to go through. And all of those things will happen when you're tilted towards the sun. So all of these things combine. So here's my sort of pretty moving diagram for the day. So if we take all of those things into account, you can see that the red shows when we have lots of incoming radiation. So right now it's summer in the northern hemisphere and winter in the southern. And then over the year, it shifts again so that we have summer in the, the, north, the southern hemisphere. And you can see that in the summer hemisphere, when we have more radiation, we don't see as much change over the distance. Whereas in the winter, we see that there's actually a really big change between the equator and the pole in terms of the amount of energy. Okay? So, just to reassure me that you know what's going on, which of these diagrams, A or B, so you have a 50-50 chance this time, correctly shows which way the Earth is tilted? So you can consult your neighbour if you want to. Okay, I think everyone's being quicker this time, so just a few more seconds for the last few votes. Right, so let's see if uh, people have got this or not. <laughs> really, guys? In, on January, is the Northern Hemisphere colder or warmer? Colder. Does that mean that the northern hemisphere is going to be pointing towards the sun or away from the sun? Would you like to change your answer? <laughs> Reassure me. Okay, just a few more seconds for the last few votes. Okay, let's take a look and see uh, if we've got the right idea this time. Good. You can probably tell from my reaction anyway, but yeah. Um, that reassures me. So it's one of those things that seems really confusing to at least us in the northern hemisphere, because we think, oh, well, if we're further away, it'll be colder. But it's not to do with that. It's to do with actually which way the Earth is tilted. So actually today, January the 4th, or at least very recently, we're tilted away from the, the sun, but we're actually closer in terms of distance. Whereas our July, we are tilted towards the sun in figure A, but we're actually slightly further away. Well, I'm hesitant to ask my next question now because I just confused everyone. But as an interesting thought experiment, what would happen if we went from having our tilt being like that to our tilt being like it is in B? What would happen to how extreme our winters are? What would happen to how extreme our summers are in the northern hemisphere? So think for a minute or two. Do you think they would get more extreme or less extreme? Okay, so speak to your neighbor. <laughs> 
Okay, so what do you think? Do you think, how many people think it would get more extreme? How many people think it would get less extreme? How many people aren't brave enough to vote? Most of you, okay. In fact, we would have more extreme seasons. So well done for the people that said more extreme. Because if we think about, say, let's think about our summer today. We're pointed towards the sun when we're further away. If, in fact, we were pointed towards the sun and we were closer, are our summers going to get warmer or less warm? Warmer. So we'd have warmer summers. If we look at our winters, which today are January the 4th, when we're pointed away but we're closest, what then happens to our temperatures if we're pointed away and we're even further away? It gets colder. So, just to mess with your minds, it's going to be something we talk about on Wednesday. This actually happens. Our orbit wobbles a little bit, and we're going to talk about the different way that happens. But 11,000 years ago, we weren't like we are today. We were actually much more like we are in B. And 11,000 years from now, we're not going to be like we are in A. We're going to be more like we are in B. So we're not changing the overall amount of energy that arrives at the Earth, but what we're changing is the distribution of that energy and things like how extreme our seasons are. And that's obviously quite important. Do you remember one of the first questions I asked on the first day was, well, how do we try and build up ice sheets? And you correctly told me that we want cold summer temperatures. So you can imagine that, at least for the northern hemisphere today, we have slightly cooler summer temperatures than we did have 11,000 years ago and we will have 11,000 years from now. So don't panic about that. We'll spend a little bit more time on Wednesday going over that, but I think it's really interesting. It's amazing how the whole system works. Okay, so the last thing we had to do today was really think about why in highland areas we also get cold enough to have ice and snow. Um, so because, especially, for example, in the Andes, where we even have big mountains close to the equator, we do have glaciers and ice and snow. So let's take a look at what happens to temperature in our atmosphere. And don't panic about all of these different names. Um, you can see that the red line shows temperature. And we are down here in the troposphere. And unless you are a military test pilot or astronaut, and I don't think I have that many of them in the class, you have always lived your whole life in the troposphere. Even if you've been on a plane, you've been in the troposphere. Okay. Um, and so if we look at what happens in the troposphere at the very lowest part of the atmosphere, then we see that as we go up in the atmosphere, it gets colder. So let's think about why that is. So first of all, let's think about what happens to our pressure. So who has tried to climb a ginormous mountain? No one? You're all too lazy. You have to go out and try and climb a giant mountain. Um, I tried to climb uh, Mount San Jacinto, which is uh, just sort of by Palm Springs. And it's really pretty high. It gets it to over 10,000 feet. And it nearly killed me because as you get high up, it gets much more difficult to breathe. So let's look at why that's the case. And it's to do with the compressibility of air. So if you have, say, a balloon, you can keep blowing air into it, right, until it bursts. If you have, say... Uh, or a, let's say a box rather than a balloon so it doesn't strike. If you have a box, you can keep pumping air into that. It will compress into that box. If you try and pour water into that, you can't keep pouring water in. It won't compress. Air will compress. And what that means is that down here, all of the air molecules that are floating around in this, this room are feeling the weight of everything else above them. We go to, say, like 50 kilometers up, then the air molecules up there will only be feeling the weight of whatever's actually above them. And so at the top of our atmosphere, there isn't as much weight, sort of, that they're not feeling as much pressure, and so they're spread further apart. If we think about what's happening down here, they're feeling a lot of pressure from the overlying atmosphere, and all those molecules are packed closer together, they've been compressed. And that's why it gets much more difficult to breathe as you go up a mountain. It's not because there's less oxygen. It's because there's less air in general, and so each breath that you take contains less molecules um, to keep you going. Okay? So why is this important? Why am I telling you all this? Because, ignore the writing for a second and just listen to me. If we're thinking about, when we talked on Friday, we talked about energy from the sun coming straight through the atmosphere and heating up the ground. Okay? Okay? 
And that ground is then what radiates energy out. And that energy that's coming out from Earth is what is being absorbed by the atmosphere. And that was our greenhouse effect, right? Yeah, everyone with me? And so if we have sort of air just above the ground where that energy is coming out, just like if you put your hand above a burner on a, a stove, it's going to feel hotter closer to the flame. And that's what's happening. Our Earth is the, the part that's heating the atmosphere. So the closer you are to Earth's surface, the warmer it's going to feel. Um, and that's also the case because there's just more gas down here. There's more uh, water vapor. There's more uh, molecules of CO2 that can absorb that outgoing radiation. And if you've ever been camping up in the mountains, you know that it may be nice and warm during the day, but it cools down really fast at night. And that's because of there's less sort of molecules around there to absorb that outgoing radiation. So in general, for this lowest part of the atmosphere, the troposphere, which is all we need to worry about for now, then the further from the Earth's surface it is, the colder it gets. And so that's what happens on mountains. As we go up, it gets colder. So thinking about that, looking at our distribution of all of our climate zones, can things like latitude, seasons, altitude, can that explain all of the variation that we see on Earth? Does it explain exactly why the tropical climates are where they are? Does it explain why the East Coast has the climate zones it does versus the West Coast? So if you're stuck with this, find a latitude band, follow it along and see what happens. OK, so let's take a look and see what people think. So most people think no, and they would be right. So for example, if we take perhaps, if we compare the east coast of the US and Europe, you can see that on the east coast of the US, then we've got, especially if we go somewhat further north, we've got these severe mid-latitude climates. And they've been really experiencing that recently with that cold air. But if we look across at exactly the same latitudes over around Europe, we don't have that. We actually have much more of the mild mid-latitude climates. And it's not because they're different heights, because they're more or less the same altitude. And so all of those things that we've talked about are important for controlling some of that distribution, but it's not the whole story. And that's because we actually have quite a complicated climate system. There are other things going on that feed into what controls climate. Um, so for example, we have our, our lithosphere, our geosphere, where we have mountain ranges, um, and that gives us topography, and that affects our climate. We also have things like volcanoes that release um, particles and gases into the atmosphere, and that can change our temperature. Our oceans are actually really important, and that's what we didn't really take into account. If we think about, say, along the East Coast, we actually have a nice cold current running down past, say, New York, and that keeps them colder in the winter, whereas actually Europe has this nice warm, what you call the Gulf Stream, if you've ever heard of the Gulf Stream, this warm current moving up from the south, and that brings a lot of heat. So the ocean is actually really important as well in having a control on our regional climates. And we're going to have a look at that when we talk about the day after tomorrow scenario, um, when we look at the, the role that the ocean has on all of this. Um, we also have things like um, our cryosphere, you can see there, because that cryosphere forms a cap over our oceans. If you have sea ice, then you're not exchanging heat and also water vapor with the overlying atmosphere. We also have the biosphere. So the biosphere also affects how much light we absorb, for example. It affects the movement um, of water vapor. OK, so that's all I have for today. And on Wednesday, we're going to talk a bit more about why climate changes, a little brief history of uh, climate on Earth, and what is happening today. Okay.